I'm Stephen Hundley from IUPUI, and this is Leading Improvements in Higher Education, a service of the Assessment Institute in Indianapolis. Our sponsor for this season is Watermark, the largest global provider of educational intelligence software solutions for higher education. In this episode, we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Lewis Stokes Alliances for Minority Participation, a grant program of the National Science Foundation serving historically underserved students in the STEM disciplines of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Our guests are Leroy Jones II, Kim Wen, and Zakia Wilson Kennedy. Leroy is Professor of Chemistry and Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Chicago State University. Kim is Director for Statewide and Regional Collaborations in the STEM Education, Innovation, and Research Institute at IUPUI. And Zakia is Assistant Dean for Diversity and Inclusion in the College of Science at Louisiana State University. I know you will enjoy learning more about the Lewis Stokes Alliances for Minority Participation on this episode of Leading Improvements in Higher Education. I am so excited about today's episode because we're going to be discussing the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation and the 30th anniversary of this important program. I'm pleased that the Zakia, Kim, and Leroy are with us. And I would like to begin by asking each of you to tell us a little bit about your backgrounds. We'd like to ask you to briefly share a little bit about what you do in your current role and what led you to this work. We'll start with Zakia followed by Kim, and then Leroy. Zakia. I'm so thrilled to have this opportunity to participate in this conversation with you all on today. So I grew up in small rural towns in Mississippi in a working class family. One of the earliest memories that I have is of my mom talking with me about the importance of community and really what are we going to do to support our communities. She would tell us that we were blessed and needed to think about how we're going to use these blessings to help others. Throughout my academic journey, high school and college, um, I benefited from summer programs and student development efforts at several HBCUs, Tougaloo College, Alabama A&M University, and Jackson State University, which is also my alma mater. These efforts were extremely critical in my development as a scholar and leader. And I'm passionate about broadening participation and have dedicated so much of my professional life to this work. Though I'm a chemist by training with both my undergraduate and graduate degrees in chemistry, along the way, I realized how I could use my passion to help students find their own paths in science and mathematics. So through my work, I've sought to pay it forward by creating opportunities and access for the next generation of scientists. Currently, I serve as an associate research professor in chemistry education and assistant dean for diversity and inclusion in the College of Science at LSU. And among the many hats that I wear, I serve as a co-investigator on the LS AMP Center of Excellence that focuses on engaging faculty and students in international activities and another one that focuses on preparing students for academic careers. These are the ways that I'm supporting and contributing to the LS AMP community, kind of what passion drives that participation and really just recognizing how much the community contributed to me and my development as a scholar and leader and really trying to pay that forward. Zakia, thank you for that introduction. Let's now come to Kim to learn about her background. Kim. My name is Kim Nguyen. I'm currently the director of the Indiana Lewis Stoke Alliance for Minority Participation and also co-director of the Lewis Stoke Midwest Regional Center of Excellence. In my day job, I also have a title called director 
of regional and state collaboration in the center in the Institute of STEM Education and Research at IUPUI. I, I came to this role and uh, function as director of the Lewis Stoke Alliance for Indiana simply because my interest in my dissertation for my PhD is on the retention and re um, and drop out rate of minority in the STEM field. And in 2003, I was fortunate enough to be invited to participate in the LSEM project led by Purdue University and served as IUPUI campus coordinator for the LSAM project there. In the next 10 years, I begin to appreciate what the program do and how we have been able to uh, impact the diversity uh, and the demographic of the student who holding a STEM degree so in 2014, I led the team at IUPUI to apply for and receiving the award from National Science Foundation to establish the Indiana LCM. And we are going strong during our fourth year, of, fifth year of the first phase of the LCM. During that time, I also serving uh, as a co-director with Dr. Leroy Jones here, uh, initially in the Pilot Center of Excellence in 2012 and later on in 2018, we, uh, uh, we are, I am directing the Lewis Stoke Midwest Regional Center of Excellence at IEPUI. And the center we call LSMRCE will be the host of the 30th anniversary of the LSM project, of the LSM program. Kim, thank you for that introduction. And I should acknowledge, of course, Kim Wen is a colleague of mine at IEPUI. And in full disclosure, I am fortunate to be one of the co-principal investigators on the Indiana LSAMP project that Kim referenced. And our chancellor, Nasser Paydar, is its principal investigator. So we've been talking to Zakia and Kim, and now we come to hear about Leroy's background. Leroy. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to participate in this um, podcast. I'm certainly thrilled to um, be on this pack podcast with my colleagues, Zakia, as well as uh, Kim. Um, I am currently the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Chicago State University and also a professor of chemistry. I've been here since 2000, so boy, going on uh, 21 years here. Um, just a little background on Chicago State. It was founded in 1867, and it's a predominantly black uh, university, public university in the state of Illinois. Um, one of the things that I want to note in my role as dean, um, I direct the largest college at CSU, encompassing the fine and performing arts, the humanities, the social and behavioral sciences, and the STEM disciplines. So right at 50 programs, you know, that I manage here at um, Chicago State. Um, but the thing that I really want to highlight is just the work that I've been doing over the last 20, 21 years um, with just broadening uh, participation. And I've been doing this, you know, working, um, directing the Illinois LSM program program, as well as Kim mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, we co-founded um, the initial uh, pilot center um, for the LSMRCE. And then also here at Chicago State, um, I founded the Center for STEM Education and Research. And uh, once again, you know, this program has really helped me to um, broaden participation of underrepresented and underdeserved minorities, females, and people uh, with disabilities uh, in STEM. Um, my journey, what really led me here, you know, goes all the way back to my um, freshman year um, when I was um, in, um, in high school, you know, so I took one semester of chemistry and then four years later, I showed up um, at my institution, Bradley University, saying that I wanted to be a, a chemist. And uh, as you might imagine, um, I was grossly 
unprepared um, because, you know, most of the students that I was sitting in class with had taken two or three years of, of chemistry. But the key was this, Stephen. It wasn't that I wasn't able, you know, to do chemistry. Um, but the fact of the matter was I just wasn't prepared, you know, to compete at the time. So my institution allowed me to go down and take a nursing chemistry and the rest is, rest is history. I went on and, and got a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry with a minor in Religious Studies, went on from there, got a PhD in Organic Chemistry, did a postdoc at Caltech in Organometallic Chemistry, and then I ended up um, in industry working for Amico Research Center here in Naperville, Illinois, as a research scientist. But one of the things that I noticed as I was going all the way through, there wasn't a lot of people that looked like me, and in particular, um, African-American um, males. So when I reflect on, you know, what actually got me here, you know, I would have to say it's, it's my passion for educating groups or what I call unrealized potential, you know, which can really span across, you know, multiple um, ethnicities. So I gain the most gratification by making students aware of opportunities, but more importantly, helping them to realize how their innate abilities align with any given discipline. And uh, that's really, you know, my, my story. Leroy, you're talking about educating groups of unrealized potential. Thank you for that introduction. And Leroy, let me just stay with you for our next set of questions. So we're going to be talking a lot about an acronym known as LSAMP. And I should remind us that that is the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation. So uh, Leroy, what is LSAMP? How did it begin? And why is it important for higher education specifically and for our broader society? Thank you for that question, um, Stephen. Um, LSAMP is one of many programs nestled in the Division of Human Resource Development in the Directorate of Education and Human Resources at the National Science Foundation in um, Alexandria, um, Virginia. Um, what's unique about this program is that it was actually authorized by Congress in 1991 to significantly increase the quality and quantity of underrepresented minority students successfully completing STEM BS degree programs to diversify the workforce. Um, when you look at what has happened since 1991, we currently have over 50 active alliances throughout the nation, encompassing more than 600 institutions. And, and why this is important to higher education is because these programs over the last 30 years have actually developed, you know, different programs and initiatives, you know, that can really serve as a roadmap um, to, to institutions of higher education, how to develop support programs for underrepresented minorities and underserved students um, in, in STEM. When we kind of look at kind of the broader society, I, I think that we would all agree on this podcast that really a diversity of thought is needed to develop the challenging problems that we face daily. And a good example of that is what we were able to accomplish during the pandemic, you know, coming up with that vaccine in a record amount of time. But the other thing, you know, um, we have to look at it also on a global scale, you know, in order for us to, you know, be com um, global competitive, you know, um, in uh, in the 21st century. I mean, and, and, and it's definitely in STEM, you know, we have to have a diversity of people, you know, at the table, you know, working on these problems and different challenges so that, you know, we can be successful moving forward. Leroy, I appreciate you giving us a background on the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minor Minority Participation, and you're describing the importance of having diversity of thought in the STEM disciplines. And of course, those are broadly science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So, Zakia, what are the types of activities or programs that various LSAMPs implement to support underrepresented and underserved students in these STEM disciplines? Why is an alliance model, and we should note that's the A in the LSAMP, um, the, why is an alliance model so critical to broadening participation in STEM? All right. It's, as my colleague Leroy shared, LSAMP has been around for 30 years, and they were authorized by Congress to diversify the STEM workforce. And so you can imagine that that means that recruitment and retention are huge components of that work. 
beyond recruiting students from historically underrepresented and underserved groups into the STEM degree programs, LSAMP has been focused on retaining those students in like our STEM ecosystems. Using evidence-based approaches, many of our alliances have used Tento's model to develop and implement student retention initiatives. This model has found that academic and social integration into the scientific community are critical for supporting the success of students who are oftentimes under-recognized for their, their potential and talent for succeeding in a STEM academic or career pathway. The alliances are incredibly important for this work because at their foundation, they are a community that is being leveraged to support and advance student success models such as Tento's, not just on a single campus, which is good, but across networks um, throughout our country. That provides the conditions for true collective impact. We currently have, as we were shared, um, over 50 alliances with multiple institutions in each alliance. There are HBCUs, R1 institutions, tribal colleges, um, and Hispanic institutions, and everything in between. The diversity of the institutions in the alliances collectively working to develop student-centric efforts to increase the number of individuals from historically underrepresented groups in STEM is absolutely amazing. Within our alliances, different universities are using slightly different approaches to do this. They have different rationales and are also um, developing programs that are responsive to their unique institutional context. And yet all of these efforts are built on evidence-based practices such as Tento's work. Some of these strategies include engagement in undergraduate research, mentoring, tutoring services, research-based courses, science communication, um, international activities, and so much more. But it's this rich immersion of students into these really critical learning paradigms that really position these students for success at the undergraduate and graduate levels and prepare those students for careers in STEM. Zakia, thank you for talking about the important work of using evidence-informed strategies to support the recruitment, retention, and success in students, for success of students, I should say, in the higher education STEM ecosystem, as you were mentioning. And you noted the Tento model. I'll just mention that Vincent Tento is the scholar to whom Zakia is referring. And we'll provide some links on our website for listeners who would like to learn more about the Tento model. And our website, of course, assessmentinstitute.iupui.edu. Kim, let's come to you now, and you lead the Lewis Stokes Midwest Regional Center of Excellence. What is the purpose of this center, and how does its work support institutions who were funded through the LSAMP program? Kim. I'm pleased to be the one who follow on the the, on the narrative that uh, Dr. Wilson Kennedy have discussed about the LSAM model and how we build various alliances to lead to successful recruiting and retaining of minority students in STEM. In 2012, the, the National Sci Foundation issue a call for a proposal to, to establish a pilot center of excellence. At that time, the pilot center of excellence thought of as serving a regional need of the alliance in the region. So we call the pilot center the Midwest Center of Excellence with the purpose of serving all the LSAM in the Midwest, in the 15, 16 state of the Midwest. But it turned out that we are, we were the only center being funded by the National Science Foundation. And we were asked to serve the national community of LSAM alliances. So we were established as a pilot to see if that is what the what the program needs to have. 
And after five years of the pilot program, National Science Foundation decided it is exactly responding to the need of the LSAM community, where the center can offer a platform for faculty, for students, for research scholars coming together to discuss, learn about best practice for broadening participation. But most of all, is serving as a vehicle to disseminate information about LSAM work as well as broadening participation effort by the National Science Foundation. So we act LSMRCE currently, it's the second cycle of this Center of Excellent Funding. And we serve NSF in two ways. We act as the distribution center for all information that pertain to the LSM community and students. And we also offer a platform for all of us come together to share and learn from each other how to best serve our student and broadening participation for minority. The current center LSMRCE is a collaborative work between IUPUI and Chicago State University in collaboration with Ohio, the Ohio State University and Fermi Lab. We are serving to respond to the need of, uh, of information sharing, dissemination, and definitely the one of the tools that the center have is develop an online broaden participation resource center where all the LSM community can uh, look up, check out the resource that available for their operation, as well as we hosting a national annual conference where all the students and scholars and administrator come and share our best practice uh, to, uh, to do our work in the uh, covering the support for, uh, right now it's over 700,000 of students currently in the, the LSM program across 56 alliances. So the LSMRCE in this particular year, 2021, will be in charge of celebrating and carry on activity that that uh, brought spotlight the success of LSM uh, program through our uh, weekly seminar in October, as well as the LSMRCE uh, conference in October 22nd through 24th. And we're looking forward to celebrate the 30 years anniversary of LSAM. Jim, you, of course, are the Lewis Stokes Midwest Regional Center of Excellence uh, Director. And that website can be found lsmrce.org. Zakia, let's turn our attention to you to learn more about faculty members and the role they play in contributing to the success of STEM students, especially those historically underserved by these disciplines. What types of interventions or learning experiences are effective and what recommendations do you have for STEM faculty wishing to make a difference in the classroom or laboratory setting? Zakia. Thank you so much for this question. Um, faculty members are important and crucial partners for LSM and for developing environments, ecosystems that support the success of students historically underrepresented in STEM. We would all likely agree that faculty are the arbiters of knowledge, but they also set the tone for the lived experiences of our students. If we return to Tinto's work, we understand that academic and social integration are important components to our students' development. We need to be able to foster experiences that help students to build their identities as scientists, 
and envision their potential for success in these fields. Recent research has shown that faculty mindsets towards student success, their ideations of who can be successful in our disciplines, that these mindsets have a profound impact on learning outcomes and student academic performance. This means that if students perceive that faculty don't believe that they can be successful, that there is less of a chance that they will be successful. This plays into the lived experiences of students in academic and research spaces, in our laboratories and other areas. It's so incredibly important. Faculty set the tone for what's in, what is expected in the spaces that they lead. Uh, faculty serve as mentors and coaches, providing key skills necessary for building credentials for career in science. They are the arbiters of access to opportunities. In this way, the role of faculty is extremely important. We advocate that our faculty adopt holistic approaches, that they intentionally seek out potential in our students and hold students accountable in developing their potential. We don't benefit from advancing students who are weak or not challenging students to move and be better, to, to excel at all the, the things that they do. No one wins when we don't do that. But we also don't benefit when we underestimate the talent of individuals, when we underrecognize potential and don't work to intentionally build that potential and cultivate that talent. One of the amazing things about the LS AMP community is the intentionality around building alliances and partnerships that cultivate the talents of individuals for excellence in STEM. Zakia, thank you for talking about the important role faculty play. And you mentioned in particular that faculty set the tone, they serve as mentors, and importantly, they're the arbiters of access to opportunities for our students. Important reminders of really the impact that individual faculty members have on students' lives and their academic and professional success. So Leroy, similarly to you, why is institutional leadership so important for this work? How can administrators create cultures to attract, retain, educate, and graduate underrepresented and underserved students? Leroy. Stephen, thank you so much for uh, for this question. You know, as a dean of the largest college at Chicago State, you know, I understand firsthand uh, the importance um, of senior administrators creating, you know, this culture to attract, retain, educate, and graduate, you know, students in STEM disciplines. One of the things that I would like to uh, point out to you, which is an aspect um, of the um, LSM, um, request for proposals is that um, the program actually requires that the president or the provost or some may call the chancellor and the vice chancellor be the principal investigators. And the reason why, you know, this was put in place is because the NSF wanted to ensure institutional leadership buy-in from the very, the very top. You know, so a lot of times, you know, the way that I look at this, it kind of provides, you know, in a sense, you know, what I call a muscle. And the reason why why, you know, this is important is because often, you know, senior leadership is needed to overcome the potential institutional barriers or challenges that actually may prevent um, the different programs from being um, successful, you know, on campus. So, for example, I remember when I first started at the university and I was directing the Illinois LSM program, it was one thing for me to uh, go to uh, one of the units on campus, you know, for my students and say, hey, I really need for you to do this. Um, but it's another thing um, if I go and talk with my dean or the president's office and they go and say, you know what, you really need to move this paperwork for for the student so they can receive their stipend to do research and in a lab. You know, so, you know, with with that, you know, being said, you know, this, you know, type of institutional leadership really supports and facilitates the development and implementation, you know, of the many things that uh, my colleague Zakia was talking about a little bit earlier when it comes to the academic and the social and the professional professionalization strategies that are critical to attracting, retaining, educating, graduating underrepresented and underserved um, STEM students. So long story short, you know, when you have a senior administration that really buys in and genuinely support these type of programs, it really, you know, trickles
trickles down to the rest of the university because it's letting them know, the rest of the university, that this is important and this is something that truly the university wants to do in terms of increasing those types of students you know, at, um, at our individual institutions. Leroy, you're describing the important role that senior leaders play in the LSAMP process. And I would invite listeners to access the request for proposals that Leroy was mentioning at the National Science Foundation website. That's NSF. Dot gov nsf.gov. You can search for Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation. And like most government websites, it's quite a long URL to get to that particular program. So we will provide a link at our website, assessmentinstitute.iupui.edu. Kim, let me come back to you and ask you to put on your hat as one of the alliance leaders, of course, for the Indiana LSAMP Alliance. We note, of course, that you and I are co-principal investigators, along with our chancellor, Nasser Paydar at IEPUI, who is the principal investigator and a colleague of ours from Ball State University, is also involved, Patty Lang. We appreciate her involvement. So, Kim, you're serving as the Indiana LSAMP Alliance director. In your opinion, what makes for an effective, sustainable alliance? What strategies are used to help, quote, lift up, if you will, institutions across the entire alliance? Thank you, Stephen, for asking such a, a question that close to my belief why we are uh, why we are in the LSM community. The community is formed by various alliances. The alliance is a collective of institution and individual commit to a shared purpose, a shared objective, and therefore, in order to lead an alliance, the first and most important is building the relationship. So we have a share, not only share belief, share objective, but we have shared responsibility and shared leadership. So my role as a director of the Indiana LSAM led me to be the expert, led me to be the guidance to help the campus champion who are coordinating our on-site program at their particular campus to operate and implement a program that supports student and student center focus, student success is our goal. So I believe with the support and buy-in of the leadership and the importance of relationship building based on respect and share responsibility, it will be the in ingredients, the element that helps a successful and sustainable alliance for the minority participation. I believe we have the Indiana LSAM for the last four years have come close to achieve that goal. When we have external evaluator asking for all the participants in the alliance how how did the partnership go? How do we work together? And everyone has scored very high on this on the level of partnership, of open communication and share responsibility. Thank you for the question. Kim, thank you for reminding us the important role that the alliances play in help helping to build relationships across campuses. And Zakia, let's turn our attention down to the individual student, because ultimately, uh, that's the population we're trying to uh, affect and, and benefit from this work. So Zakia, in what ways have individual students benefited from their involvement in various LSAMP programs? What are some examples of positive outcomes individuals have experienced because of their participation? 
So students in LSAT programs benefit from direct support and really this immersion in an ecosystem of evidence-based practices that have been designed to cultivate their talents as young scientists and engineers. Let me give you an example. Paid research experiences are particularly impactful for our underrepresented students from low and moderate income backgrounds who must work during college. Without these types of developmental experiences, these students would be shut out of building skills necessary to be successful in a STEM academic or career pathway. Academic supports like supplemental instruction and tutoring help students to learn. Mentoring helps students to build social capital and agency to understand what kinds of experiences they need to have to be competitive for things like fellowships, which are crucial for financing graduate study. Mentoring also supports students at critical junctures in their academic programs, even learning how to apply to graduate school. There's a young woman who I know who, as an undergraduate, was an exemplary student, graduating at the top of her major. In fact, I think she had the top GPA of all the chemistry majors in her class. No one really told her how to apply to graduate school while she was an undergraduate. Everyone assumed she knew what to do. She didn't go to graduate school, and this impacted her career trajectory. Fundamentally, LSM programs demystify what is needed to be successful and helps to prepare students by providing critical information and support that help them to envision and navigate their academic and professional pathways in STEM. This work fundamentally changes lives and by that also changes and can impact generations. You know, you can imagine what the trajectory looks like for someone that has these types of supports that doesn't come from the background with the social agency and knowledge to be able to navigate these fields, how having access to those kinds of things positions them and positions them like for themselves, but also for their families. Zakia, thank you. You're reminding us that individual students benefit from support and immersion in evidence-based educational experiences. For this next question, I'll first come to Leroy, followed by Kim. 2021 marks the 30th anniversary of the Lewis Stokes Alliances for Minority Participation, or LSAMP. What are some of the lessons learned from the past three decades and how will this important milestone be recognized and celebrated? Leroy. Stephen, thanks for the question. And um, I want to really go back to an early question that uh, I answered, you know, uh, just talking about the importance of institutional leadership. And, and one of the things that I want to highlight, and I think that we've really learned over the last 30 years, is just the support of institutional leadership is critical you know, for these type of diversity programs. Um, when you have the support of your president or your or your chancellor, it really kind of sets the tone for the rest of the university uh, that the university uh, is in support, you know, of increasing the numbers of the diversity uh, in the in the STEM disciplines. And it really facilitates a higher degree of inclusiveness, you know, on campus and acceptance of, you know, different types of students in the in the discipline. Um, another thing, um, kind of when I think about lessons learned, um, I think one of the things that the LSM program has been able to do is to remove the false narrative that underrepresented and underserved, underserved populations can't do and excel in STEM disciplines. And earlier when I was introducing uh, myself, I told you a little bit, you know, about uh, my story. And in my case, you know, it wasn't that I couldn't do STEM. I just didn't have the proper grounding to be successful um, in that um, particular discipline, you know, such as math, the chemistries and the and the biologies. Um, so the LSM program has really, you know, provided, you know, just different support programs, different support mechanisms to show that, you know, if these particular uh, things are put into place, you know, students can not only um, um, to see but they can excel and move into the STEM workforce or work toward graduate degrees, you know, so that they can contribute um, to the, uh, the body of knowledge and science. 
Leroy, thanks. You're reminding us the important lessons learned around support of leadership, setting the tone for this work, and how that providing support programs for student success positions STEM graduates for success in the workforce. And Kim, let me come to you again, some lessons learned from your experiences and how this important milestone will be recognized and celebrated. Kim. Thank you, Leroy, for uh, taking us to the benefit that we have seen and the uh, accomplishment that the LCM program have achieved for the last 30 years. We have grown to 50 some uh, alliances supporting thousands of students currently, but because all the Majority of the PIs as well as a program director, they are STEM research scientists. For the last 30 years, we have graduated thousands of underrepresented minority who become leaders uh, in their field. For instance, Dr. Jerome Adams as our Surgeon General was one of our LSAM earlier. We have had thousands of students career uh, recorded in the recent LSAM magazine published in early 2020. And among those, they are, they are trailblazer, they are innovator in various fields, but there was such a lack of publications about our success, about best practice have been implemented by the LSAM across the country. So in the recent five, six years, NSF have noticed and begin to recognize the lack of publication on the success of LSAM program and practices. So in recent years, the well-established LSAMs must have, must include in their leadership team a social research scientist. Therefore, we can begin to publish paper, go into talk and uh, do some more dissemination of the program success. So one of the lessons learned that I am as a director of the LSMRCE noticed is we need to give a lift for these scientists, practitioner to publish paper about LSAM. Therefore, we are collecting a peer review articles to be published in the Frontier in STEM Education that collective the special volume about LSAM best practice and, rep, and LSAM achievement will be uh, uh, released in October 2021 as a celebration activity of the LSAM program on top of our LSMRCE hosting the, the annual conference in October. These are some of the activity we are planning for in recognize and uh, promoting the success of LSAM and definitely EMARC, the anniversary of the LSAM. Thank you, Stephen. Kim, thanks to you and Leroy for sharing some of the lessons learned and ways that the LSAMP programs will be recognized. And you highlighted the importance, of course, of ongoing dissemination about program successes. As we conclude our time together, I'd like to ask each of you, all three of you, to talk about some of the future trends you foresee unfolding in the next three to five years related to LSAMP's mission of serving underrepresented and underserved STEM students. So how should alliances be prepared to address these trends? For this set of questions, we'll first come to Zakia, then Leroy, followed by Kim. So Zakia, consult your crystal ball and what does the future foresee for you? 
I am looking into my crystal ball and I shall tell you what I see. Um, just all kidding aside, I think that a, a key trend for LS AMP is going to be expanding the development of individuals from underrepresented groups as global scientists. In recent years, we've had a huge national focus on cyber, and we desperately need to develop talent in this area. But our recent pandemic has inspired a new generation of emerging leaders in science to think about other problems, big problems that our society faces and unique ways that scientists, just not our technologists and computer science, but also basic and applied scientists can address those problems. In some ways, this is our Sputnik moment. And we're not just talking about developing scientists who are contributing in the US, but we're talking about developing STEM scholars who are positioned to be game changers on a global scale. Um, because the problems that we are facing are not just national, they're global. This requires technical skills, but also global and multicultural competencies. The LSM community is well positioned to cultivate the talent of our underrepresented students for this. And our alliances are doing this. We just need to expand some of this work. It is a growth area for us. Um, this needs to be on our radar and it needs to be a key focal point of our training models across all of our LSM alliances and institutions. And, you know, if, if you've been listening throughout this podcast, I think you would agree with me in saying and thinking that the impacts of LSAMP on higher education in our country has really been incalculable. Um, I agree with so much of what Kim shared. The lessons learned need to be disseminated. I'm so excited about that upcoming issue in Frontiers and STEM Education that will highlight empirical studies of work of the alliances. More of this is needed um, so that we are continuing learning from others in our community and positioning those outside of our community to learn from the oftentimes heroic work that we are doing um, so that they can also engage in some of these things. So Zakia is uh, challenging us to produce game changers prepared to address the big problems facing societies on a global scale. So Leroy, to you, what does the future look like from your vantage point? And yeah, Stephen, thanks for the question. Um, you know, when I left Amico and I returned to Chicago State, uh, the push was to uh, really educate uh, underrepresented minorities and underserved populations to encourage them to go into in the STEM. Um, when I started working at Chicago State, I, I saw the problem was a little bit, you know, deeper than that. So my center started to develop programs to really kind of, you know, deal with post-secondary students, you know, to get them into the pipeline. Well, once again, working with the post um, secondary students, you know, I, I start pushing down into uh, the middle school. So where I'm going uh, with this is that, you know, one of the things that we're going to have to do in the future um, with our programs is just try to figure out a better way to engage the, the K-12 sector. You know, two things are happening. One, we're losing too many potential STEM students, you know, in the pipeline. But the other things that we're that we're seeing where LSAMP really kind of helps to fill the gap is, is that we're having too many underrepresented, underrepresented minority students and underserved students showing up on campus um, underprepared for the rigor of the of the STEM disciplines. And, you know, one of the ways, you know, that we can actually do this is, you know, really kind of looking at that K-12 sector and trying to develop more teacher preparation opportunities to kind of minimize the high attrition rates amongst uh, STEM K-12 teachers and, you know, and, and, and make sure that those teachers are equipped, you know, with the proper training um, so that uh, they can help these students succeed, you know, in the disciplines, you know, as they move toward uh, college. Leroy, thank you. You're reminding us, among other things, of the need to foster greater linkages between K-12 and higher education, including a focus on teacher preparation. Kim, finally to you for this question, what does the future look like from your vantage point? The future for LSAM have to be linkages to other sector of the economy of the, uh, the U.S. and global, which is 
uh, career development, how we can equip our graduate, our LSAM scholar, with the skill and the knowledge necessary for the growing economy and technology a paradigm shifting here. So I see in the next few years, we as director of LSAM alliances is responsible to connect, to build bridges with corporation business and industry to give opportunity for our students to see why they study STEM and what kind of employment opportunity awaiting for them in those private sector, besides those who inspire to become professor, earning PhD to be STEM scientists, we need to diversify our STEM workforce with very highly aware and skill provided to the LSM scholars. So that's what I'm seeing is we are connecting with the world and to, uh, to, to really make the program as a leader, as the, the changer of the STEM economy. Like Zakia and Leroy, Kim is reminding us a future trend focusing on, quote, connecting to the world. As we conclude, I'd like each of you to leave our listeners with a brief final thought. And for the brief final thought, Kim, we'll start with you, followed by Zakia, and conclude with Leroy. So Kim, what is your brief final thought? In the Leo Sam or the Lewis Doak Alliances for Minority Participation cannot sustain without faculty mentoring. We can, we as Alliance Director, we need to continue building relationship with the faculty who are mentor, who are role model for our students who will have the inspiration to succeed in the future. The work continue to rely on our work and our appreciation of the support we have at our particular institution. Kim, thank you. Now, Zakia, for your final thought. As an undergraduate, I've been admitted from LS Amp on the campus of Jackson State University. As an investigator on LSAMP efforts, I am so proud to be contributing to that legacy of LSAMP. We have come so far, such a long way, and yet, as Kim shared, there's so much work to do. Collectively, the alliances are well positioned to do this work. We need the support of Congress and the National Science Foundation to advance and build upon the, the, the legacy of the past to push us forward into our future. I am very honored to be a participant, contributor, and a leader in it. Zakia, thank you. And finally, to Leroy for your final thought. Thank you, Stephen. Um, when I think about the LSM program over the last 30 years, um, we have you know, accomplished quite a bit, as my colleagues Kim and Zakia uh, were saying, um, but there's still work to be done you know, in order to affect that congressional mandate back in 1991. But you know, the flip side of it is that our future is very, very bright. You know, one of the things that the pandemic taught us was that um, as a society, we're very resilient. We're also a very resourceful nation when we put our minds together to tackle, you know, challenging problems. And, you know, a challenging problem is um, diversifying, you know, the STEM um, workforce. You know, so so with that being said, you know, I am just looking forward to working, you know, with uh, my LSAP and colleagues, you know, in this broadening participation arena to, you know, to, to move the needle, you know, in a sense, and diversifying STEM disciplines, you know, in this, in this nation. I'm proud to be affiliated with the LSM program and very proud of all the work that we've been able to accomplish over the last 30 years. Leroy, thank you. We've been speaking with Leroy Jones II, Zakia Wilson-Kennedy, and Kim Wen. And in particular, we've been recognizing and celebrating the Lewis Stokes Alliances for Minority Participation, which is achieving an important milestone in 2021. It's 
30th anniversary. And in particular, our episode today has referenced a lot of models, publications, and resources. And we'll provide these not only in the show notes for this episode, but also on our website. That website can be accessed at assessmentinstitute.iupui.edu. Leroy, Zakia, Kim, thanks so much for your time with us today. Thank you, Stephen, for this uh, this opportunity. Stephen, thank you so much for your great work with this effort and for really bringing us in to, to highlight the work that we've been doing with LSM over the last 30 years. Stephen, thank you for giving us the opportunity to showcase the accomplishment of the LSM for the last 30 years. This has been Leading Improvements in Higher Education a service of the Assessment Institute in Indianapolis. Learn more and access other episodes at our website, assessmentinstitute.iupui.edu. Our sponsor for this season is Watermark, the largest global provider of educational intelligence software solutions for higher education. Learn more at watermarkinsights.com. Our podcast producers are Chad Beckner, Caleb Keith, and Shirley Yorger, with original music composed by Caleb Keith. If you know someone who might enjoy the podcast, please encourage them to give us a listen. We appreciate you helping to spread the word. I'm Stephen Hundley from IUPUI, inviting you to join us again for Leading Improvements in Higher Education. Thank you.